Darkcast Network. The light shines brightest on our indie podcasts. California True Crime is a podcast that sometimes deals with heinous acts of violence towards other individuals. This podcast may not be suitable for everyone. Listener discretion is advised. Welcome to this episode of California True Crime. This episode, we're taking a break from our regular cases to talk about the documentary on the streaming channel Hulu called Captive Audience, A Real American Horror Story. It's three episodes about the kidnapping and return of Stephen Stainer, the crimes of Carrie Stainer, and the experiences of their family. With me to talk about this documentary are Sean and Charles. How are you guys doing? I'm, I'm doing good. I'm also doing good. Excellent. We also want to thank listener Matt Mercier, and I think that's how you say his name, I'm so sorry if I got that wrong, who contacted us about the documentary and suggested we do an episode on it. It was a great idea, and we thank you for that. We're also going to share some of his thoughts and some other thoughts we've seen from people on the internet, on Reddit, places like that, as we go through and talk about this documentary. I will put a spoiler warning here. I don't know if people need those for documentaries, but... Just in case, we are going to get into each episode and talk about some of the facts and things that happen. So if you don't want to watch it and already know what's going to happen, don't listen to this. Also, if you guys don't know, we, um, we did cover this case. I think it was the most intense coverage. So we did a total of 15, 13 on the kidnapping of S- Stephen Stainer and two on, on the victims of Carrie Stainer. And so if you haven't listened to those, I mean, the the reason we're kind of doing this because we've we've covered this before and it's uh something that was close to home and uh so this was a great idea for Matt to um refocus the attention to it and uh be able for us to revisit and talk about it again so captive audience a real american horror story was released on hulu on april 21st 2022 and i think all three of us just watched it this past weekend so about a week ago the way i heard about this documentary was it pop just popped up on our hulu feed how did you guys hear about it the same because you know we share a hulu feed so i knew you you put it on on our like queue or i guess whatever the hulu version of that is but I didn't really look into it. I wasn't actually aware that it was about the Stainer brothers and and a family perspective until Matt sent us the message. And then I went back and looked at it. Uh, My friend Andrew, he told me about it, asking if I watched it, and I didn't. And when he suggested it, I still didn't watch it. Sorry, Andrew. But um, yeah, I, I knew it was there, but I didn't watch it until this last weekend. Captive Audience was produced according to IMDb by High Five Content and Wonder Burst and was directed by Jessica Dimmock. Dimmock is a documentary photojournalist and a documentary filmmaker. She directed other things, including a documentary called Flint Town, which I have never seen, but I actually know, Charles, is something you've talked about, something you've wanted to see for a while. Yeah, actually, that one, uh, it's about uh, the police department in Flint, Michigan, as they struggle with the dwindling resources and the crumbling infrastructure and really kind of focuses on on what a community is like uh, when it's crippled by violence and everything that's gone on in in Flint, Michigan, contaminated water, um, being part of the Rust Belt, rampant poverty and and unemployment. So I I didn't know it was done by the same person until you actually found that. I was kind of excited about uh, watching that one. So after watching this one, this is on my watch list for the next week. I haven't watched a lot of documentaries, so this is my first one uh, that she's done. How about you, Sean? Have you seen any others that she's done? I, I have not. All of her documentaries uh, and sound really interesting, so we'll be sure to put a, like a link to her IMDb so people can check out all of the stuff that she's done. This documentary, though, is three episodes. Each is about 46 to 47 minutes. 
And I'll admit, I think because the cover art of the documentary was, it's a picture of Steven, or it is a picture of Steven, made up of other pictures, I thought the entire documentary was going to be three episodes just on him. Right. But it is, in fact, about two episodes on his kidnapping and return, and then the third episode includes, it's kind of a mixture, but includes Carrie Stainer and the Yosemite murders. So uh, to go over the episodes, I thought we could just break them into the first two and then talk about the, you know, the third one last. It seemed to me, just to kind of give people an idea of how the documentary is set up, that the documentary tried to focus those first two episodes mainly on Steven Stainer, as well as the people who knew him. They interview his children, Ashley Stainer and Steven Jr., as well as his mother, Kay Stainer, and even people that Steven Stainer knew during the time that he was kidnapped, so people he grew up with. It didn't focus too much on the details of his kidnapping, but instead, but instead, I believe it tried to give his perspective. To do this, they focused heavily on the TV miniseries that was made in 1989 called I Know My First Name is Steven. My understanding is that miniseries was based on the book I Know My First Name is Steven. That's written by Mike Eccles. But this documentary actually doesn't bring him up or the book up at all. We also did not include that book in our episodes. But what they did use were interviews with Stephen and other family members and the director of the miniseries, Larry Eichen, and one of the screenwriters, J.P. Miller. So you're getting the story with Stephen Stainer's own words from those interviews, but unfortunately the tapes aren't in good condition, so a lot of it is transcribed. And they share the quotes via the actors who played Stephen and Carrie in the miniseries. So that's Corin Nemec, who played Stephen, and Todd Eric Andrews, who played the older Carrie Stainer. And the story is really told kind of parallel to the miniseries. I liked the fact that they had the actors read the transcripts from the tapes that couldn't be aired. You know, it's it's interesting because I'm the exact opposite of you, and I I really didn't like the part that they had those two people on there. I felt like hearing, even though it was rough recordings and just having like subtitles up, instead of having them read it, I thought that was very it it took away so much for me i i just didn't like it because then they had personal opinions which i understand what you're saying is that like uh cory nemec was actually with steven at at some points he they they talked a little bit but i still felt it was it was very distracting when you had all the family members that i just wanted to hear from in the first place these people just played them they were actors kind of like i know how like johnny depp became hunter s thompson and like it never left him, but still, I feel like they don't actually know him. They just played a role from what the director and producer wanted them to to be, and I still yeah. feel that it took a lot away because listening to them talk about it instead of the family members wasted time for me. I'm I, and I'm not trying to just disagree with what you're saying. It's just this is how I felt when I watched it. Yeah, I can see why you say that, Sean. Um, I think. Th- We had a similar discussion in our house about the difference between them reading it and them acting it. And I I would agree with you that there are a few times that I feel like they were acting and then talking about the acting experience rather than talking about the victim. Uh, And and that, that took me out of it. I don't mind necessarily somebody reading a transcript if the tape isn't isn't good or sometimes you know that can even be a little bit hard to understand or even with subtitles but i i will say there were a few times where i felt like it was an actor and not but i i will i will push back on that i the fact that cory nemec was in that especially um when when the daughter and is talking about the movie and her relationship with the movie and i thought that was really poignant and it was it made it more understandable why they would have him in there right So I kind of felt the same way as you, Sean. It just seemed a little distracting, especially because you have people you're not used to seeing being interviewed. There's so many podcasts, including ours, on this topic, and there's not, in their own words, you know, Kay Stainer or the children or his sister. And you have that. And I understand these tapes are, you know, I'm sure they're really cool. It just, you could hear parts of them when they would play them when the director was talking or producer or something, but not necessarily when Steven talked himself. So I felt that same way. And then I looked at some press interviews uh, that were done when this, when this came out. I will link some on our website. And in press materials, the director said that she put the actors in there. They came up with that idea after talking to Ashley Stainer. 
because as what you're saying, Charles, she was talking about how big of an impact that movie had on her and how that's who she kind of thought of as her dad in her mind. That's the picture she has of Corin Nemec. So I thought that was kind of interesting that up until that point, they probably wouldn't have been included in the documentary. Mm -hmm. But it's not just that the documentary has both aspects. It's that it really kind of follows the miniseries as this, Right. As the backbone of the right. documentary. And I do think, uh, you know, I think towards, and this is really, to me, it made more sense after you watched the second episode. When Ashley's talking about, again, the family's relationship with the movie. Kay talks about the, the, the movie in a little bit. And you really see how, how that, and again, you know, I know in our episodes, we talk about the, that in the impact that that movie had kind of in a tangential way. But. It made more sense that they were there after you get through the second episode. That that is that, unfortunately, for these kids, that's almost their memory of their father, you know, or their connection with their father. And with honestly, with a lot of us, and you know, that that, that is what we know of Stephen Sainer is that uh, miniseries. When Ashley was telling that story about how that's what she thought, you know, her dad was and everything like that, and I, I can completely relate. In a weird way, because when I was young, my dad was an actor and he was gone for weeks. And I watched a movie where he gets his head ripped off by a fish monster (laughs) and it scared me to death. And just the impact of it, knowing, just seeing it, I could just kind of relate to her story of like, that's the only story she had of Mm -hmm. her dad and comparing it with the actor. And that would, that makes a good point. But yeah, I can just, that. Her whole story just made me remember that whole story of my father. So let's talk about some of the things that you liked about those two episodes. Sean, what, what, is, what is something that really stood out to you? It was definitely the, the family interviews and just seeing their emotion, seeing their stories. You know, the, just at the beginning when they bring out the two boxes that they said they've never looked through. That's like hard and exciting all at the same time. And hearing stories from Jody and Kay, I, I mean, like I said, I think the the interviews with the actors and just the the constant references to the uh, miniseries um, and the footage of it kind of took away from it. But when they did talk about the story and talk about the family impact during this whole time, it, that was the first time, even when we were doing our own, I'd never really seen interviews with any of the family members. So to see their emotions to hear their own words and just to hear them articulate how they felt and what was going on was very very impactful throughout this thing yeah i agree with you too because i think doing you know because these interviews were a lot different than what we'd seen on major media outlets at the time of steve steven stainer's return you know that you can see on you know youtube but those they're impersonal they're you don't really get the whole story this this was it was a more intimate and close portrayal of the family you know especially a family that had spent so much of their lives in the in the storm of media coverage um you know and and the stuff that Kay would and wouldn't talk about i thought that was interesting you know and understandable and how she talked about her son and, and both sons and, and her family and her, and her, and her grandchildren. Um, you really saw her strength. Yeah, I agree with you. That was one of my favorite parts because when you're researching it, as we did, um, you see a lot of backlash to the mm-hmm. family and to Kay Stainer in particular, especially after, you know, as things happen with Carrie and things like that and things like that. But so you don't see her doing a lot of interviews, which is understandable. Um, This is a really high profile case and a lot of people want information, but that she would do this, I thought was, I don't know, pretty cool. And maybe I'm reading into it, but it seemed to me she was kind of doing it for her grandkids who were using this as an opportunity to search for information about their dad Mm -hmm. and to hear his voice on those tapes and to tell their part of the story and kind of set something straight. And she didn't have to come and do an interview. You know, none of these people had to put themselves in front of the public again. I thought it was pretty brave that she would, would do that. I think how we've done it, so many other people have done it, this was a big story. It's like when you stare at a word or say it too many times, it starts to... It loses all meaning. Yeah, and it doesn't... And to see this 
it, it became human again. And, you know, you get these, mm-hmm. these stories over and over again, and they just become this background. And this is like firsthand experiences to hear the story all over again in a different way. And so it's a very interesting perspective. Especially, and I won't say this, you know, we haven't, we're not at the third episode yet, and we're really focused on the first two, but I'll say this whole thing. It did something, and I remember, I remember you saying this a lot during, during our episodes, Jessica, is that Stephen, Stephen didn't want to be known as just you know, the boy that was kidnapped. And I felt that, that so much of this story revolves around the kidnapping, but this was, a, this was his family talking about him. You know, and so I, I really, that was the f- part that I really enjoyed about the first two episodes was that this was not a typical, I would say true crime documentary of like, you know, the, the disembodied voice talking about, you know, on a cold November morning and such and such on a corner street and they go and they didn't go into like every gritty detail. It was really focused in on these families experience and from their perspective and what they wanted to talk about their loved one and, and the legacy that he left. It was also good to be reminded. I mean, they brought up um, the whole press yeah. and the interest in the story and just people coming to their house, which I was, I was always good to be reminded of, um, especially since we do a podcast and we're always trying to decide how we're going to act and treat people. Um, it was also hard to watch those first two episodes. They showed video of Stephen once again being interviewed over and over mm-hmm. and over again, and he's just a kid. It's hard to watch that. So I think they did a good job in personalizing him and that that experience in a way that I really appreciated. And it was, and I know we it's it's different when we talk about it and see it in in black and white too, and even watch some of those archival interviews. But you know, I I think it was important to remember how old he is. In those interviews, he looks like an adult, but he's 14 at that time. So, yeah, the, the, again, it's that that whatever it is that allowed him to hold it together as a 14 year old in the face of all that, you know, was amazing. So we asked Matt, who suggested this episode again, um, to give us some of his thoughts. And one of the positive things he liked, he agrees with us, is that uh, he thought there was he had a great amount of respect for Case Daner for doing this. That she had was said to be cold and distant by the narrator of the 2020 episode back in 2019, but she came off well in this documentary. Um, I think that's a really important because, like I said, there's a lot of backlash to her particularly as time goes on, and I think nobody knows how to be interviewed or do any of these things, and you have all these terrible things happening to you, and people are just reading into everything, mm-hmm. and so I liked that she was there to give that interview and tell her story. Yeah. So I agree with Matt. We also looked at Reddit for some examples of what people had thought of the movie. And um, lots of people liked it. They were especially the same as us, like the interviews with the family. Uh, a lot of people liked the the movie being part of it, or the miniseries, I'm sorry, yeah. because it was something that had affected them. They, they'd seen it as kids. And so, yeah. you know, it was it's part of the the crime, I guess, or the story that it's taken on, this life of its own. And it has really re- good reviews on Rotten Tomatoes and other places got good reviews all over the place. So I think there's a lot of people who like it. So I would definitely say check it out. But in these first two episodes, is there something that you would want to do different or you would have liked to have seen that you didn't? For me, I think it was the it was the the reliance on the miniseries. And I agree, I think for you know, a lot of people at that time that miniseries was a was a big was such a you know, pivotal TV moment and it's but I felt like the the mini series was used in place and this goes back to what you were saying earlier Sean I think the mini series was used in place of hearing more stories from the family right and I think that whole writer producer thing when they would have the writer and producer what they were talking about from the mini series I think that bothered me also Just because Mm -hmm. there were some things about how they were like saying they were changing real life characters when they had all these interviews to make it sell better or for people to watch it. And I think they had good intentions. There was times where it seemed like the writer and the producer were they had good intentions, but still it was still a Hollywood miniseries. The path that they took for this new movie is different than every... (laughs) thing before so that's that's probably good 
how they did it. Maybe I just didn't think that's what it was going to be. So I went in thinking, what is this? Instead of actually enjoying it as much as I should have. But it was different from what we usually get. Well, and I I, I felt that same thing when they had, it was interesting to hear like the writer producer like you know talk to Steven or like their their feelings about the person I was I got pulled away from from that when they started talking about them writing the episode now I will say that you know in defense of that again when you get further into the documentary when the family starts talking about like the problems with it and their relationship with it and even Steven's relationship with it. I think that makes a little more sense, but I I felt there were certain times when I felt like I was watching two documentaries in one, like one was like almost a making of the miniseries, And the other one was about the family. Yeah. I think it's good information given the documentary doesn't play like a big part. The miniseries, I mean, doesn't play a big part in my memory. I kind of remember it, but it's not the same that I see other people online talking about that. That's, that's the story of Steven Stainer that they know. So I guess in that way, it's good to know that they took liberties with it. But I'm with you guys that I'm not sure I needed to hear it in snippets, if that makes sense. Um, and I and I do wish we could have heard the actual tapes. I mean, that's nobody's fault if they weren't usable in that way. But um, it would have been nice to have heard, you know, Steven Stainer's voice and his own story and his answers to questions. I think that's why in the second episode, when you see more interviews with Stephen as he's older, you know, after he comes home and, and, you know, he's, he's working, he has a family, he's being more of an advocate and, and working, you know, and, and more of a public face and you see him at more, and again, this is an outsider watching the video, but he seems more confident in his role of, I'm talking out about this. I really liked that part. Again, Stephen talking about himself. His experience, what you know, what he's doing that. Yeah, I think I th- again, I think that the, the earlier part kind of detracted from that. Yeah. And I just hope it's not the direction that things will go. Like, think about it in 10 years, they do another Zodiac thing and they just use the movie Zodiac and they have Robert Downey Jr. like reading lines or something like that. It just seems odd. And I understand they did it like what you were saying, Jessica, is important. Zodiac was an important movie to me, too. But yeah, I wouldn't want to see that the the rehashing over and over again. Yeah. But the interviews and tapes and actual footage is great. I really like that stuff. Did you know that the AIDS pandemic almost wiped out an entire generation of a culture? Did you know that politics drive the way we handle pandemics? Did you know that more people died of smallpox than war-related injuries in the Revolutionary and Civil Wars? Do you have questions about the opioid crisis? How socioeconomics fuel healthcare? Wonder why the cost of drugs is so high? I'm Jackie Moranti, and I host a podcast called Cause of Death. This show explores all of these questions and many more. If you haven't listened to my podcast, you should. Cause of Death can be found wherever you listen to podcasts. Our history is here to teach us lessons, but as you'll find out, we rarely learn our lessons. One of the things that I saw over and over again, and also that Matt let me know that he didn't like, and I think it's really hard for me because I agree with him, but I'm trying to keep in mind what this documentary was supposed to be instead of what I thought it was going to be, if right. that makes sense. But I saw this over and over. It's not just us, um, that people were unhappy with the fact that there wasn't information on Parnell or Murphy or Matthias. There wasn't information on a lot of information on Timothy White or um, even in the third episode, which we're going to get to in a second, on those victims. Um, and I think this documentary was not meant to be that. But I can also understand why people felt like there were details missing. Yeah, I, I agree with you. I think if it, going into it, think, and I, I, I loved how you said that. And I think, Sean, you mentioned something similar too. the idea of going into it, thinking what I was going to watch or having, having thoughts or anticipating what I was going to see rather than walking in cold saying, 
I'm just going to watch what's on the screen and I'll, I'll put all everything else aside and really just try to, to look at it as its own thing. I think it's, you know, hard for us because we've done you know, a lot of work on that story w- w- amongst ourselves growing up in the area. Like we did, we, you know, we were, we were constantly bombarded and, you know, it's a, a topic of conversation and things like that around the case. So I will say I brought a lot of preconceived notions of what I wanted to see, and I don't. That's not the point of this, right? And it could have been a stepping stone for someone new who doesn't know the story. This is the first thing they see. They see family interviews. They see this mini series. They get into podcasts, listening to the episodes. This is just new to them, right? But like you were saying, even at the beginning in the the intro, during the intro, it has all those different scenes that are going on in the intro and it says age six kenneth parnell like it's going to show a picture so it seems like that's kind of a oh they're going to go into kenneth parnell's background a little because they have it in Mm -hmm. the intro little scene but on each episode and it never gets into it one of the things i'll say before we go to the next episode is that i also really liked how they didn't go into detail about the actual abuse which is something i know we felt really strongly about you know, we want to use this to talk about sex abuse in this terrible crime, but in a way that doesn't trivialize or, you know, you don't need the details of that to care about it or to try and figure out how to change it or stop it or change our own behavior and how right. we may be helping it. So I really like that aspect of this documentary. Yeah. I, on that note, I think to me that was perfectly summed up when Corey was talking about being the, you know, annoying little sister and pestering him and pestering him and pestering him and pestering him and wanting to know the details and wanting to know the details. And when he finally told her the details, she said, I, I can't ever unhear that. And the question was, well, are you, are you glad that you know those? And, he, and, and her response, I think, is kind of indicative of a lot of people. People, people want to know, but you don't. You don't need to, you know, it's, it's a terrible thing that happened. Everybody knows that terrible thing happened. It doesn't define the person. But people are still curious about what happened. That makes sense. Yeah, which, I mean, is amazing that she's so honest in a documentary. She was a kid. And that's so important to us, like, thinking about how we talk to kids now about if they come into contact with somebody who's experienced something terrible. How are you going to handle it? How are you going to be respectful? I think it's so important for people to be honest about that because she's a kid. She didn't know any better. It's not her fault. No, not her fault. No, of course. But it's her being so open and brave to openly say that and that she regrets it, I thought was pretty amazing because that might at some point in the future change how someone, you know, thinks about how they conduct themselves or speak to somebody. I also thought it was pretty brave of, of, of Kay as well to speak on the idea of they're not taking Steven for counseling the, and, and not in an accusatory way, but that was, you know, that's something that we didn't do. And and being kind of upfront and honest about that again, you know, and you know his wife Jody saying the same thing. Stephen just wanted to put it behind him, but maybe in some way was able to. I, I mean, I mean, at least outward appearance was able to have a life, but not stigmatizing. And I would have maybe have liked a little bit more talk about. And maybe th- this again, this is not the documentary for that, but somebody talking about how a victim of this kind of abuse feels the pressure and the stigma behind it when they come home and the, and leading to their reticence to, to look for help or counseling. Yeah. It definitely felt like the interviews are really honest, which I think yeah. is so important because I'm sure, you know, they'll get backlash from whatever it is you say, but it's so important for us learning all of us to move forward and how we're going to conduct ourselves with other people who are kidnapped or go through this or whatever it is. So I think it's pretty amazing that they're willing to do that. And I think also they were just Kay and Ashley, Stephen Jr., Corey, all of them were extremely relatable as could be any family member of of mine. And their emotion was real. And they drew me in to everything they said. And, you know, I was I was catching myself making facial movements like smiling or you know like Mm -hmm. actually just feeling it as they're talking which is weird to me because that doesn't usually happen too much and it was just their their voices were just something i could listen to well and it is funny too and i i caught myself the first couple of times Kay is on and speaking you know about her son and and their life and i 
And I, yeah, I, you, I love how you said that, Sean, that she was relatable because, you know, it's pretty close to where we grew up and she sounds like, you know, people in my family of how they talk, how they sit, how they act, you know, that, that certain amount of stoicism, but the, how, how she carried herself. I, yeah, it was. And again, just, it, it put me in awe of what these, what this family has had to put up with from honestly, people like us who report on, on the tragedies of their lives, but from everybody, you know, uh, people in town, people out of town, out of state. It's just, and the fact that they, after all of this time, would do this and, and again, put themselves in the public space to talk about their, their loved ones was impressive. So let's talk about the last episode in the documentary. This is the third episode. Uh, that one, to me, felt a little disjointed. It's one episode on Carrie Stainer, but it also has still some stuff on Steven Stainer. It covers the Yosemite murders, but it was a fast episode. It flew by. Yeah. It doesn't, again, it doesn't provide a lot of information. This this documentary is heavily focused solely on the family and not on the other victims or the other people uh, in the crimes. And I wasn't really sure what to make of this episode, its intent. Uh, what do you? What did you guys think of this episode? I could, going back, I I feel like I I expected more discussion of the victims, and I really think it was about halfway through the through the last episode where I realized again I have to remind myself of that's not this documentary. This documentary is really focused on on the impact that the Stainer family had had to deal with because of this, and that may sound a little bit harsh, but I I think that hearing the family speak of that was was the point. And. As we've talked about this documentary with all the family interviews, I think bringing up Carrie, we can see that even his own family are victims to what is going on and we need to see what's going on. And one thing that this third episode brought in was that, I mean, you have the the both sides of the pendulum of Stephen and Carrie, but then I, the one thing I didn't like is how they, they just added more characters that don't seem to fit to, for me, like I think having Ted Rollins on uh, kind of took away from the story because then it like focused about him going on all these different shows, talking about the information he got from Carrie. And that really doesn't have anything to do with these, the family. It has like a, a third party kind of just getting themselves involved. So I didn't like that part, but I think the story is they're they're put together because they're brothers and you kind of have to bring it up. That's the hard part. It's just how it is now, it seems like. You can't have one story without the other. Do you disagree? No, I, I, I agree with you to, to a point. I, I think it really is, especially now, somebody's going to bring up, you know, if somebody talks about Steven, I think now most people will bring up Carrie and vice versa. What I struggled with a lot in this episode was the belief that he did this because of what happened to Steven. Right. And it seemed like assumptions. It was just a lot of guessing from a lot of the different people and, why yeah. he did it. And I, I felt that really came through when they interviewed his mitigation specialist, which is, I will admit, is something that Jessica and I paused the episode, went to Professor Google and looked up that there are actually mitigation specialists who, you know, help to craft the story that the defense is going to use to get the jury on your side. And that's, I felt there was a little bit uh, almost of an apologist's stand on this of, well, let me tell you that this terrible, terrible person that did this terrible crime did it because, you know, of what happened to his brother. Yeah. When again, and if you haven't listened to our episodes, we really recommend you go back and listen to those. But I know that you, Sean and Jessica both had brought up in, in our, in our Carrie Stainer episodes that he had had a history for a long time of questionable behavior around young girls and women from an early age. Right. But I think also it's, it's just interesting because mitigating circumstances seem to happen with anything. And it's hard just to like, we have lives. We're not just a template and it like things happen. And I'm not saying, you know, I'm not on Carrie's side or anything like that. I just, that guy was fascinating. The, the, yeah. Mitig oh. mitigation specialist he was a fascinating human and the whole story that part i thought was really interesting 
I think that was some like what you're talking about for me, Sean, was summed up when they asked Kay and Kay said, I'm not going to talk about that. Yeah. And I, I really felt like you could see the pain of a mother. Like, how do you talk about that? You know, she she lost one son has, and now as is facing that, that her other son has done this despicable act. And there's no there's no comment. There's no, you know, there's no explanation for that. I also really like the mitigation specialist. I thought he, his name was Michael Kroll and he was really fascinating. Um, and that job is fascinating. But I think that my problem with this episode is that there's information, but there's also not enough information. And then there's people speculating, but there's not enough information that they're giving you where you feel good. At least I didn't about the speculation. I already have, you know, issues with speculating why yeah. multiple murderers do what they do and always connecting to the family and that kind of thing. But it's like they're giving you some information. I don't know. It was just kind of that episode was all over the place for me a little bit. I'm with you. It felt disjointed from the, like, instead of being another part of a whole documentary, it felt like an incompletely different documentary that wasn't quite done. Like, almost like they didn't necessarily know how to close out. Like, what do you say about Carrie? Which I kind of understand because we yeah. had the same conversations when we started uh, recording the episodes of Steven. And we actually talked about not doing Carrie episodes because we were kind of making the case that this is that Steven um, is a case that always gets ignored and or there's not as much emphasis on it. Um, and then in the end, it, like you're saying, Sean, it just they're just always going to be connected, even if it's two separate people. And even if someday we know the reasons are totally separate. Yeah, it's still affecting this whole family. You know, they're having to answer to people. There's definitely a backlash to the whole family, I think, mm -hmm. that I saw, at least on the Internet and places like that when researching people saying, well, there's got to be something wrong with this family. And I don't know why people murder each other, but I definitely Nobody know does. no one did anything to get their child kidnapped. So it's just, it's just really frustrating, I think. So it's, it was nice to see that perspective of, of them having to answer for things that they, you know, weren't a part of. But And going back on what, what Sean said earlier, too, is that it's another instance, and I know this has been always something that we've tried to emphasize since we started this podcast, but that none of these crimes happen in a vacuum. That we're not talking about the, the women that were murdered that were the only victims of that. Their families are still suffering. The Stainers are still suffering with this because of what you know their relative did. The community is still reeling over this, and, and to a certain extent, you know. And so these crimes affect more and more people when you really look at it. And I think that I think that was a. I would have liked to have seen a little bit more of that too done, and, and really. And I know again, it's hard if you, if if the family has, you know, isn't talking or or. But well, I think at the end, I think it was Ashley that said that we have our own stories. And I think that was very important to hear that because yes, just because it wasn't you that either did something or had something happen to them, it spiders out and it really hits close when you're a family member and stuff. In all captive audience has received great reviews and it sits at 91% of Rotten Tomatoes. Uh, would you guys recommend this documentary to somebody? I would if it came with a preface or like a warning label and and that would be this is not this is not what you would you think of it's not going to be the documentary you think it is go into it like I guess with no preconceived notions uh and 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 watch it for what it is I I think any documentary is worth uh recommending just because it can't like I was saying it could be a stepping stone it could you know you have someone who watches this and then they go dive deep into it and who knows they might uh, a mitigation they might become a mitigation specialist for you know who, who knows but yeah it was definitely in the three episodes there's so much more and yeah. jessica you you taught us that from everything that you researched so it's you know it's a story that has a lot more twists and turns and a lot more information but i think to see the family first mm -hmm. like that that could give a totally different perspective as when you actually do learn more about it so who knows our perspective might be different if we saw this before we research researched the rest so i you know i i, I like how you said that too sean because i i think that i agree with you this would be a great com companion documentary 
to somebody who's interested in these cases, who's maybe either watched some other stuff or, you know, and then use that as a way of like, you know, learn about, learn about the victims, learn about what happened, you know, in, in the Yosemite murders, learn about, you know, everything that, that Stephen had to endure and, and went through, but, you know, don't forget the family, you know, the Stainer family and how, and their involvement in this. Yeah. I think if you're looking at these events, any of the events that we cover, they're like puzzles and this is, mm-hmm. you know, the family and the people it actually happens to are the most important pieces of right. those puzzles. And to get that straight from their mouths, like, both of you just said is is rare and important um and it's just another piece of that puzzle to help you understand even further the whole story along those lines with another piece of the puzzle or uh, like you know something to to watch or research while you're watching this documentary we would always say that the book in the name of the children by jeffrey reinick is one and we've mentioned it before in episodes but a bulk of the book really revolves around his interview with Carrie Stainer and being the person to kind of take his confession. In fact, in the documentary, there is a small scene where you see Jeffrey Reinick when they're taking Carrie through the murder scene. But um, I think that's another perspective of the case, of the, specifically the Carrie Stainer case, but even even his interest in, in Stephen's kidnapping. And I think, again, it's another layer of more information. So... You know, the idea of not always getting all of your information from one source. What about you, Jessica? Would you would you recommend this? Would oh, this- yeah, definitely. Definitely. Was there something that stuck with you watching this documentary or something that you took away from it? Not anything that we haven't already said before. I think, again, I just to, to talk about the resiliency of a family that for, you know, we're going on now over 40 years ha- has been has been in center stage in some cases and some of the worst things that could happen to a family and, and their resiliency and, and how they've, how they've dealt and and come through it, you know, uh, for better or worse. Yeah. Maybe I was digging too deep into my own thoughts on it, but just watching the family, anything we do and say can make a big impact on people. So, you know, any little bad thing, any, good thing can make a huge impact and it just Mm -hmm. it goes down the chain no matter we all make impacts no matter how little it can mean a lot so just hearing their stories it it made an impact on me which they don't know me they don't know their certain words were going to say anything to me but it did and i think it's just important to know that That, that's that so reminds me and i'm i know because obviously we just said Jess and i watched it together but the moment when when and they show the scene in the in the miniseries when Steven and Timmy get picked up by the the Hispanic man in the truck and and thinking about like that one guy stopping to pick two kids up on the side of the road in the middle of the night altered their lives and how power, like how powerful one small right. gesture can be for me the thing i took away i think is uh, Kay Stainer had a quote in the documentary towards the end where she was talking about uh, that the pain and the experience of these events never goes away. She says, quote, nothing ever closes ever. It stays with you forever. And I think that will just stay with me as we continue to cover mm-hmm. cases. And I think about what people experience and go through and how I want to present that to you know our listeners. Thank you for listening to this episode of California True Crime on the Darkcast Network. For a full list of our sources as well as more information on this and all of our cases, head to our webpage at californiatruecrime.com, where you can support the show by joining our Patreon, which has options for ad-free episodes. On our website, we have up and running with some California True Crime merchandise, t-shirts, mugs, and special episode exclusive stickers. If you'd like to contact us, you can find us on Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook at Cali True Crime. Make sure that you subscribe to our show and to get our latest episodes. Leave us a five-star review and tell a friend. Get the word out about California True Crime. We'd like to thank our quality control engineer, Melanie Duncan. This was recorded at Snail Ranch Studios and The Hangar. 